This is the introductory session of a study called Your Twelvefold Divine Power. And I want you to know that I'm talking about you, the title of this series together. My Twelvefold Divine Power. Together, my Twelvefold Divine Power. Perhaps that's news to some of you, to know that you have divine power. And not only that, you have a twelvefold divine power. It indicates that there are twelve aspects to your divine power. This is an esoteric study of Jesus and the twelve disciples. The twelve disciples representing the twelve disciplines of your mind are the twelve aspects of the twelve attributes are the twelve qualities are the twelve faculties of your mind. Mostly the theologians think of Jesus and the twelve disciples as historical figures or theological figures. But ladies and gentlemen, the whole Bible is a book about you. Say to yourself, the whole Bible is a book about me. The whole Bible is a book about you and the way your mind works. You see, the Bible is a manual of mind operation. I like that. And all of the characters and the events and the places in the Bible represent various aspects of the operation of the mind of man, the mind of God in man. Now, in this esoteric spiritual study, in this esoteric Bible study, Jesus and the twelve disciples represent you and the twelve faculties of your mind. The theologians never guessed it. You'd never learn this in a million years in the average church or school. I'd like to get into some definition here. Let's define Jesus. And you see, Jesus may be defined from a historical point of view, from a theological point of view, but I've got news for you. Jesus is more than history. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is more than history. Yes, Jesus is Mary's baby, but Jesus is more than Mary's baby. And Jesus is more than just a theological concept. I'd like to share with you one of my understandings of Jesus. Jesus is the God-conscious mind in man. Jesus is every God-conscious man. Jesus is the one, everyone who knows I am. Jesus is the master mind in man. And I don't want this just to be something impersonal. We must make it personal. Because here the Christian evangelists are very correct, maybe more correct than they realize when they invite us to accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior. You see, God must become personal to you. Jesus must become personal to me. Now watch me blow your mind. I'm going to bring it even more closely. God must become personalized in me, through me, and as me. God must become personalized in me, through me, and as me. And you see, this is what makes and made Jesus Christ what Jesus Christ is as a person. The fact that Jesus was so God-conscious that God became personal and personalized in Jesus, through Jesus, and as Jesus. Oh, yes, 
Jesus became and was so conscious of God that when Jesus spoke, God spoke. But if you leave that on the shores of Galilee, you've missed the point. If you put that 2,000 years ago and leave it there, you've missed the point. Because what did Jesus tell his disciples are the disciplines of his mind. What did he teach the faculties of his mind? The works that I do, maybe you'll do. No, the works that I do, shall you do also. And in order to do the same works that the master did, you must have the master mind. You must have the master consciousness. You must have the master power. And you see, this is the whole idea of Jesus and the twelve disciples. You must give to every one of the aspects of your mind the master power. Let me hear every one of you say, I have the master power of God in me. You see, this is what made Jesus a master. He had the master power. These titles are not just titles that you can pin on you. You must get these titles in consciousness. That's why I'm glad for those of you who are talking about certificates. I like for you to have your certificates and your credits. But realize that all of your real credit is in consciousness and what you do with it. Some people are more desirous of the title reverend than they are of the consciousness which alone can make you reverend, a practitioner. Ladies and gentlemen, only the consciousness of a thing can make you that thing. No man can say that Jesus is the Christ except by the Holy Ghost, except by the Holy Spirit. You must have the spirit of whatever you want to be. So then Jesus is the God-conscious mind in man that within you that knows who and what you are in God and who and what God is in you. That's Jesus. And this must become your personal savior. It must become personal to you. You must personalize it just like Jesus did. I've got news for you. The only difference between Jesus and any other person is purely consciousness. Jesus is God's son and Jesus knows that. And the only difference between the average person and Jesus is that a man is God's son, but man doesn't know it. This is why, again, Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When you know the truth, that you are the Son of God that sets you free from the belief that you are a son of a gun. And it sets you free from all that sons of guns are heir to. The truth of you is that you are the Son of God. You're a child of God. And you see, when you are born again, you are born into this mind. You are born into this consciousness. You are born out of humanity into divinity. So this is Jesus. I've told you before and it's worth repeating. When I say Jesus, I mean something so far beyond what the average person is thinking about. When I say money, I'm talking about something infinitely beyond what the average person is even thinking about. People think I'm just talking about dollars and dollars alone. When I'm talking about the one thing that is everything, which we call consciousness here. Because again, a part of our definition of Jesus says that Jesus is the one, everyone who knows I am. Because in the scripture, I am says I am God. And beside me, there's none else. And I'm going to give you this again and again and again and again and again and again until you produce it and demonstrate. I am is awareness of being. Now, just stop and think about that and feel that for a moment. You are announcing your awareness of being. You're saying that you am. Bad grammar, but good meaning. I am aware. This statement unmasks God. This statement is the unmasking of God. In the scriptures, God is hidden behind many masks, as it were. And to those who do not 
have spiritual discernment, you see, God is hidden behind the personality of Jesus Christ. Whereas the truth is, Jesus Christ is to be the revelation of God. Every man is to be the revelation of God. You are here to be the revelation of God. I am here to reveal God together. I am here to reveal God. Because I want to make this clear also that these are training sessions as well. It's going to heal you. It's going to enrich you. It's going to solve your problems. So stick around. I am here to reveal God perfect good. Don't you forget that. I am says, I am God. The awareness of being is God. Why? Because I am creates everything. Everything that I say that I am. Everything that I think that I am. Everything that I believe that I am. Everything that I feel that I am, I become. But until I add something to I am, I am just a great big infinite am. So if I want to be something, I must work with I am. I must add something to I am. This time I'm going to add healthy to I am. Let me hear everybody say, I am healthy. I am healthy. Now you see, I am is God. And when you become aware of being something with your awareness of being, God, or I am, creates it and brings it to pass. This is why again the scripture tells us, let the weak say, I am strong. Why? Because whatever you add to I am, you become. I am creates it. It's so simple that it's profound, but this statement again, what does it do? It is the unmasking of God. I don't want you to forget that. This statement is the unmasking of God. And I can add so many things to I am. We can add rich to I am. But remember, we most of all must be sure that we are adding to I am subjectively. We must feel it. We must believe it. Subjective reality always becomes objective reality. Subjective reality always becomes objective reality. Subjective reality always creates and becomes objective reality. Whatever I say I am in my feeling, in my gut, in my heart, in my mind, Whatever I say, I am, I amness creates that. I amness becomes that. Why? Because I am God. I am is the making power. And that mind in you which knows I am is Jesus. I don't care how dumb you think you are. There is a mind in you that knows. I don't care how poor you think you are. There is a reality in you that is infinitely rich. I don't care how weak you think you are. There's a reality in you that is infinitely powerful. There is that in you which is aware of God, infinite good, perfect good. And whatever you add to this I amness of your being, you will express. And the mind in you that knows this is Jesus. And we hear the Master Jesus repeating this over and over again. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am the bread of life. And the ascended Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring. I am the life. I am the way, says the mastermind. Meaning what? Awareness a being is the way to be whatever you want to be. If you want to be rich, what is the way to be rich? Be aware of being rich. What is the way to good health? Be aware of being healthy. Yes, even while you're sick, the way to become well is to be aware of being well. Even while you're poor, the way to be rich is to become aware of being rich. Why? Because I am God. Now we understand who Jesus is, don't we? Now let's go on in this introductory session of your 12-fold divine power. 
Jesus' calling the twelve disciples is a symbol of the God-conscious man who by discipline and training raises the twelve functions of his mind to apostleship. The twelve functions are aspects, are attributes, are qualities of the mind must be made disciples. That is, they must be disciplined by the God-conscious man before they become apostles. An apostle is a disciplined quality of the mind raised to its office of spiritual leadership. An apostle is a spiritual leader. But the apostle must first of all become a disciple, must be disciplined. The twelve disciples represent the twelve-fold power of your mind the twelve functions, the twelve faculties, the twelve aspects, qualities, attributes, and disciplines of your mind, which you must call, teach, train, give power, and command to serve your good purposes. Ladies and gentlemen, you have a job to do, and the sooner you do it, the better. And until you do it, you're going to suffer. And that is the job of mind discipline. No, it's not always an easy job. Look at the time that Jesus had sometimes with his 12 faculties, or his 12 disciples, trying to teach them and train them and discipline them. He asked them once, you fellas stay here and pray while I go yonder and pray. And watch with me for one hour, and when he got back, they were asleep. Making disciples is an inside job that I must do. Mind discipline is an inside job that I must do. I want you to understand that. I'm coming back to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter, and the first verse in a few moments. Your mind functions must be disciplined. Your mind functions must be made disciple. If you do not discipline the functions of your mind, they will act like an unruly mob and keep your life messed up and confused. Let's put this in the first person so we will all know what our work is, and I'm going to help you to do this work over the next 12 sessions. I must discipline my mind. I must. I must discipline the functions of my mind. I must make disciples of the functions of my mind. You see, ladies and gentlemen, when you discipline the functions of your mind, when you make disciples of the functions of your mind, then they serve your good purposes. They serve your God purposes. But I've got news for you. If you do not discipline the functions of your mind, they will disserve you. Judas didn't get disciplined, and he disserved the Christ. He betrayed the Christ. Now, Judas has to be redeemed, and we are going to redeem Judas in the twelfth session. Because Judas represents that aspect of you that you do not discipline. Don't go pointing your finger at Judas. Judas is why? Oh, you. In an undisciplined state. Every aspect of your mind that you neglect, either through willfulness or ignorance to discipline, will betray you, will betray the Christ. This is why I said a while ago, everything, every event in the Bible represent some aspect of your psychology. Theologians, they never guessed this. They're talking about Judas. Judas went and hung himself. And never guessed that the Bible writer was trying to tell you that if you don't discipline your mind, your mind will hang you. It'll hang you. It'll worry you to death. Uh-oh. It'll irritate you to death. It'll aggravate you if you don't discipline it. So get your finger off of Judas now, and you've got to redeem him. There are some steps for making a disciple of an attribute of the mind, steps for disciplining the mind. And here they are. The first step says what? Recognize. 
You must recognize the faculties of your mind, that they exist. A quotation from Reverend Ike, what you recognize, you energize. And you see, this recognizing the attributes of your mind is a part of the calling of the disciples. So again, when it says Jesus called his disciples, it means Jesus recognized the attributes of his mind. Jesus recognized the qualities of his mind. Jesus recognized the aspects of his powers of being. And when you recognize the qualities of your mind, you do what to them? You energize them.